Satnam, yogis and yoginis. Let's talk about that. Unless somebody wants to say something in the chat, let's go, let's go into that topic. So we have the hardware of the brain that there is a, a particular structure on how it was um, evolved, how we do, it evolved as we were as a, as a species evolving from animals, uh, reptilians to mammals and primates into humans. That we're going to explore in the next in the next session. But as we come into the surface of the brain and we go higher into the higher aspects of the brain, we can see that there is a, this polarity aspect. There is a polarity also manifesting within our brains in the two hemispheres of the brain. And this is something uh, quite well explored and very, very much there's a lot of research on this. I'm talking scientific research and yogic research, but the yogi research is uh, more about how do I feel when this hemisphere is active. And we can tell because of the nostril that is active. We have explored this in detail in a number of videos before. You can see more about this in the video on Nadi Shodana, Nuloma Viloma, in which I explore how to balance the brain. But basically there is the yin and the yang, and there is some qualities which are different from one and the other. Basically when one of the nostrils is active, that tells us which of the hemispheres is active and that's the kind of energy that is being stimulated. And actually, it's, it's literally like that. So I showed in, another, in that video how there is a, um, a, a resonance of the brain, there is a scan of the brain, and you could see how one area of the brain was being more active, and that was linked to the nostril that is being active, and generally the area of the brain that is more active, it's the left. I'm saying generally because this is the this is what we have learned to value in our Western. And I'm talking about from the West now, yeah, in our Western educational system, which is actually very universal right now. But the way we were brought up, it was to actually value left brain thinking. So we need to talk about this. What is this left brain thinking? And what is the right brain thinking? Or left hemisphere and right hemisphere? And what are the advantages and what are the inconveniences of both? How is it? Um, how, what kind of functions does the left hemisphere produce and the right hemisphere? And how can one help or hinder us? So there is a, there is a, um, a useful manifestation of their functions and as something that is going to be against us. I always say like the dharmic and the karmic side. Yeah. So let's explore that in, in a lot of detail. And I will do a, a drawing for that. Uh, the drawing I'm going to do is going to be, um, well, let's do, let's simply do um, a head first. So this is the brain. And there's going to be two halves. And you know, the brain has this. I'm just doing random. Eh? I'm, I'm not done. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing like exactly the way the falls are, but it's like a walnut. Yeah. Something like that. Kind of looks like a brain, hopefully. All right. So th this would be our ears. This would be our ears. And this would be our nose. It's a long nose. <laughs> All right. This is a brain. So I'm talking here about left and right. And you may have heard about this, you may have heard how the left is more logical and rational, the right one is more artistic. So a good way for me to always remember which is which, which is the, the rational and which is the logical, I draw these letters, the L of left, like this, very, very 
Stiff. Sticks. Straight. But strong. <laughs> st, st, st. Uh, very simple. Mm, logical angles. Pam. That's the, the left. And the right. I like to do... Something like this. Yeah. <laughs> Something kind of um, artistic and beautiful, creative, yeah, like that. So if if you think about how to draw the R and the A and the L, that's an easy way to always remember which is the logical and which is the which is the um, creative, yeah, Rrr, creative, yeah, and logical. So that's another little trip on how to think about this. But what I'm going to do today, we're going to, I'm going to draw this like, um, like a butterfly. Why? Because I want to draw a butterfly <laughs> for no reason. But well, you, you will see why. But um, let's see, how are butterflies? This is where my drawing skills like that. that and the other wing maybe because I have two daughters and they are always drawing butterflies so they love butterflies why not <laughs> all right well okay the first thing, I'm going to write here, why do I do this kind of butterfly? Because I mentioned there is like a dharmic and there is a karmic aspect to both of them. So uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to describe here the higher, the best qualities of the left hemisphere thinking and here the right hemisphere thinking. And these are when we go too much into this hemisphere, what happens? And this one, when we go too much into this one, this is what happens. So this is like the pro and the con. Or this is like the the dram, sorry the dharma and the karma we could we could also say no or virtues and, and vices we could also say so let's see some of these uh, functions of the brain let's see how they are well the the very first of all very first and I'm gonna do I'm gonna do and I'm, I'm gonna try to do more good ones than bad ones <laughs> let's say but uh, let's see how it goes well the very first thing that we come into which is that the left hemisphere controls the what is happening in the right side of the body and the right hemisphere the opposite so the very first thing this is the left so it's actually like that so when I move my right hand that is actually controlled from the left hemisphere of the brain and we know that the right hand is the one that has more uh, pre precision, yeah? So the left brain is the one that takes more uh, curve, curve, care, takes more care of uh, precise things and um, little things, yeah? Taking uh, care of precision and little things. And this is the hand that we write with. Now, left-handed people, there is a high chance that if you are left-handed, your hemispheres are actually crossed so, so the actually your right hemisphere is the one that is logical and the left one is the more artistic so that that can happen by the way that you utilize the hands I believe yeah uh, so I think it's like this I read it some time ago many years ago and I still believe it's true if anybody knows if it is so or maybe it has been disproved please tell us in the comments but um, initially, that's what I think. So basically, the right hand is the dominant hand, and that's the one that writes. And for writing, we need a lot of precision. And the left brain is the one that is taking care of that. So that's already bringing us one, the next quality of the left hemisphere of the brain, which is detail. Detail-oriented, yeah? Paying attention to detail and the little things the little things are the things that matter and um, while the right brain 
is more like the opposite. This is more about, it's not about the details, it's about the context, contextual, and therefore more opening up. So details is going something closer and making it small. This is about opening up, finding the, the context, finding the holistic aspect. What is the, the impersonal, yeah? Impersonal, the global. Not one detail, but how this detail connects to this other, and this other, and this other, and this other. So relationship between elements. Eh? Relationship between elements. I'm not writing every single word, just doing it like this, but uh, if you can hear me, then you can, you can see. This. Let me see if I can focus better the image. Yeah, there we go. So it's more global, it's relationship between the, the elements. Now, let's go back to the left. Because it pays attention to the details, it wants every little thing be in its place. And every place, it has to be its right place. And funny that this is the left, yeah? But this is the, how something is right and how something is wrong. It's about, it's going to apply a certain number of logical rules. Something is right. And then logical is, is analytical. It's, um, it's critical thinking. Yeah. What else? Because it pays attention to the details, it cannot look at one, more than one thing at a time. So one thing at a time, this is called sequential. And by looking at this step, and then this step, and then this step, logically, analytically, slowly, the orientation is towards uh, solving particular problems, so problem solving. But solving the problems step by step, one after the other, yeah, in a, in a very logical way, which, which brings another of the big capacities of the, of the brain, of the left hemisphere. Let me carry on here, we will come back here, which is mathematical. This is very much like a hardware, like, in, sorry, like a computer, yeah? So it's this going step by step, trying to find a, sequ a sequence of things that are going to help me solve some problem. This is like computation. And uh, reasoning. Particularly about numbers, number reasoning, yeah? So this is all left brain. Taking a problem, taking a situation, analyze it, critically uh, see what is wrong, and then go detail by detail, mathematically, uh, do the computation needed to go step by step towards a certain solution. Um, it, it cares about how is the state of everything, what happened, logically understand everything, how it happened. So that's uh, paying attention to the facts, and um, and then going back to its memory of what it knows about these things so that it can try to find how to fix it. So uh, logical thinking and these rules, they depend on how I learn how to deal with this. So this is linked as well to memory. So retrieving memories and, f and seeing the facts, and analyzing it in that way. So let me just go on because I wrote so many things. I will come back here in a moment because it, this is just coming in this way. So it's natural that to carry on in this way. So the next one would be uh, language. I want, I want to explore language because the, it's in both hemispheres, but in the, on the left, the language, it's, about, it's more verbal. It's about understanding language and produce language and it's it's reading you know writing yeah and but verbal communication okay i think the wing is full i think it's enough yeah we got six things 
hopefully it gives a, a comprehensive understanding of what the left hemisphere is doing. Now, I have to say, even though I'm separating the hemispheres, the hemispheres are very connected and they are constantly in exchange one with the other and both are active and they are both interacting. Yeah, it's not, we are not just purely operating on one hemisphere. It's very interesting. I remember in the university when I was studying computing sci computer science, which by the way, that's another Western approach to mind. Yeah, I mentioned in the introduction to the course that the Western approach was from psychiatry on the, on the lower layers of the brain, neuroscience, to understand the mechanisms and how do they, does it have an effect on brain activities, brain functions. Then we, we talked about psychology, trying from the outside talking to the person, trying to change behavior. Now there is another understanding from the West, which is computers, trying to create a machine that is intelligent. And you know what, maybe, maybe in this course we can dedicate one video to talk about artificial intelligence as well. And what does it mean for us as yogis? Maybe it could be interesting to explore and explain how does, you know, ChatGPT and all these things work. And if, if you're interested, let me know. I mean, this is something that I studied, so I am, I am very interested about the topic, but maybe for yogis is not. I don't know. If you're interested about this, let me know. But um, so uh, right now, as we, the, the, two, the two, oh, yeah, that's what I was going to say. When I was studying in university, I remember, because I took some subjects from psychology and from other uh, degrees and like extra, extra credits, you know, so I took one um, from psychology, a few from psychology, and there was one, I was just curious about the brain and I learned, I read a book on neuroscience and there was, there were very, very interesting experiments of people who had to cut their, their two hemispheres of the brain. And maybe they had some disease or maybe they had some, yeah, some problem with one hemisphere and they had to cut it. And basically only half of the brain was working. There is also a video, a very interesting TED talk in YouTube. I'm sure you can find it on, uh, I don't remember her name. Maybe if anybody remembers, you can write it down in the, in the chat or in the comments of the, of the YouTube video. Uh, she did a TED talk, but she was having a stroke and she was uh, going into the right brain and she was having this incredible experience, very beautiful, but also very alarming. And uh, the whole process that she went through, and because she was, she had studied neuroscience, I think she was a neuroscientist. She could talk about what was, she knew what was happening in her brain right then. Sadnam Vijay Katat, welcome to the stream. Hello, hello, we're talking about the brain today and the mind, but right now we are in the brain, the two hemispheres of the brain. So, um, yeah, that TED talk is fantastic. But in this book I was reading, I remember they were showing these experiments and, you know, when they would cut a person's, uh, the connection between the two hemispheres and they had to operate on only one, if they had to draw, like they said to them, okay, draw um, a clock, uh, a watch, yeah? And they say, okay, no problem. And they would do like this because they know they are round. And then they would start putting numbers and they were like, one, two, three, four, five, six, because they, they knew that actually, uh, maybe I didn't do it very well. Okay, let me, let me do it again. They would do like this and they would say, well, yeah, a watch, you know, like, like to tell the time, yeah? They say, oh yeah, sure, let's do it. And they do one, two, three, that's better, yeah? Forget about this, yeah, not this. And then, but because they have only half a brain, the other half was cut, they decided to, well, I know there is 12 hours, but I don't have enough space because they were only seeing this side. So they started doing four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Really incredible drawings of asking them to draw a clock and they would literally draw the whole circle, but then all the numbers only one side. So this is like only half of the brain was active and they could, they were trying to fit all the numbers that they knew were in there, but only in the, in the, this half. And even for people who were, who would have suffer from some 
particular uh, problem in the in the one of the hemispheres. The other hemisphere can learn to do some of the things that the other hemisphere can do. So the brain is very interconnected, very plastic, and it can change its activity. Um, and as I said, this is like a simplification, kind of, and there is an interconnection, but the two hemispheres are, are like this, and they do have a very specialized function. So we saw the left, let's go to the right. We saw that it was connecting to the the side of the body that they are uh, working on. The left is more detail-oriented, the right one is more contextual and holistic. The left one is more logical, analytical, critical. Okay, so the third one, in contrast with the logical aspect of the left brain, the right brain is emotional. And is emotional processing and expressing. Sorry if you don't understand the writing, but hopefully you can hear my voice, yeah? This is just to get it on an image. It helps me to see it clearly on the, on the page, yeah? And it helps me to, 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 to connect the things, that the thoughts that I'm having around this. Now, this mathematical aspect, in the, in the right brain, this is something else. Rather than computing and sequential and analytical and logical and looking step by step, when we zoom out and we look at the global connection, one thing with the other, it's where the creativity arises. Creativity is about uh, connecting things that are not normally connected. If I tell you to do write a story, it's like so open, you can write a story about anything. But if I tell you, look, write a story about a... Natarash, a little dancing Shiva, a, a moon, and a pebble. Ooh, Natarash, moon, and pebble. Suddenly you have three constraints, three little things. Now the right hemisphere of the brain is going to say, how can I connect these three things? And you start thinking, well, Natarash... Natarash is surrounded by a circle. It's generally a circle of fire, but could this circle of fire be connected to the moon? Maybe we could connect it to the moon, and the moon is white. Maybe the pebble was white. Could it be that the pebble is uh, reflecting the light of the moon? And maybe when the light of the moon is reflected on the pebble, the Natarash appears. So once upon a time, there was a girl, and she was going to the beach, and every evening she would sit and throw pebbles in the water, and one day she was holding the pebble. At that moment, exact. The moonlight hot shone on the pebble and the Natarash appeared. And she spoke to Natarash. Natarash. <laughs> I'm just making a story. But this is the, the, you know, I'm a father. I have two little daughters. And every night I make a new story. They ask me for three elements and I make a story with them. And, and this is what happens when, they, when I hear the three elements. My right hemisphere of the brain. How can I connect these three? What is the relationship the, the, the connection between the different elements and then I stimulate the creativity and allow for a story to come out of that. And now we could carry on with a little girl looking at Natarash and talking to Natarash on the little pebble under the moonlight, right? It's just an example. I totally improvised it. I wasn't preparing it at all. But this is the idea. When you are in the moment, you are improvising. That's another, another good one, yeah? Improvise. It's creative. It uh, stimulates the imagination, art, imagination. Any, anything artistic, eh? music as well, all, all those things, yeah? So this is the right hemisphere of the brain is most active when you are doing all that. And um, look, if we are not looking down into one little spot and we are opening up, as we open up, we perceive the wider space. So that's, that's something that the right hemisphere is also in charge of, spatial abilities. Not spatial, not special like something unique, but spatial like space abilities. So an awareness, yeah? Abilities and awareness. Where I am in the world. 
and see the 3D perception, yeah? Um, so where am I around? What is around me? Where am I? Yeah, what is the context around me? The ecology around uh, my decisions, the ecology, how they are going to impact the space around me. And uh, one more, because I have space. Ah, because I mentioned language, so let's talk about communication. Now, the communication on the left hemisphere is about understanding and produce language, is verbal communication. This, the, the right hemisphere, which is more about emotional, therefore it's linked to nonverbal communication. And, and, and recognize faces. Because the face reflects the emotions that we are going through. Satnam Amita, hello, welcome. I had not seen your message. I don't know how long has it been there, but uh, welcome to the, to the stream. Amita, we are talking about the brain today. We're starting a course on the mind and we are talking about the two hemispheres of the brain. And um, yeah, you're just on time. I've been talking for about an hour, but you, you can find it recorded already, so you can, you can watch it later. So, look, the left one is going towards the details and slowly and logical and going to the little things. That's kind of like going inwards, you know, going towards one point. Let me see. And um, something like this, yeah? Going in. And then the right one is about finding the context, going into the wider space, going global, going holistic and being creative. That's about like going outwards, like that. So going inwards and going outwards. That's a good way to, to see it. This is the butterfly of the brain. I hope you like it. Yeah. I'm going to put it here. Butterfly brain. So, these are the higher qualities of both hemispheres. Amita says, I always catch up with the recording. Yes, wonderful. Yes, great. <laughs> Excellent. I will cut up. I will, I will, I always, uh, maybe I should mention this. I, I do these live streams and I leave the whole live stream in the channel. There is a part for live streams if you go into the channel. But then some of them I can I cut them up in pieces this one I will cut and I will do the introduction to the mind course and the first part of the mind course which is what we are recording right now so this will be part one of the mind course the new course that I'm starting on the channel because I I was looking forward to doing this course and now we are in the right time before Christmas to start talking about the mind so all right so these are the the higher functions and healthy functions of the brain hemispheres. But what happens when we are too much in one of them? What is the effect of being uh, spending too much energy and, and activation in that hemisphere? And, and as I mentioned, up until very recently, it was too much on the left hemisphere. The emphasis, we have to remember that the educational system, the schools, this was invented. Yeah, it was invented, especially if I don't remember wrong, during the Industrial Revolution and, and getting ready to, yeah, Industrial Revolution and, and it would help a country be productive. If you produce children with a great emphasis on the left hemisphere, then you're going to have children which are helpful and productive to the country. <laughs> so because they are going to be logical and analytical and, and, and kind of following orders yeah because this is about logical order and and details paying, paying attention to detail and obedient in a, in a certain way this is more creative and free and open yeah this is more uh, following directions so uh, stimulating the left hemisphere stimulating maths science engineer engineering all this is bringing a great advance to this industrial revolution, as I mentioned. So um, that's why it was brought to the children from very little. Um, when my daughters uh, started in preschool, the school that we, we have them in, they are very, very modern and open, very artistic, very creative. 
as soon as they turn six, they had to move into primary school. And in primary school, they have to follow a curricula from the government. And it's so much left hemisphere brain. It's so much, it's math, it's language, it's uh, verbal skills, it's about analytical analysis of things and critical thinking and logical. And it's, it's all so much left brain. I mean, that's cool. Fortunately, it also has some dance classes and theater and yoga and music. So they have some other things to combine with them. But the amount of left brain activity is huge. And I remember my daughter saying, I, I have headache when they would come in home. They were coming home and like my head hurts after so many hours in the school. And, and it's a lot of hours, right? It's from 8.30 in the morning to 4.30 in the afternoon. So many hours with so much emphasis on the left brain. So of course, we end up with a society that is more left brain uh, focus yeah if you are a mathematician somehow it seems like there is more value than if you are a painter why no or a musician why should it be i don't know i don't understand you know but somehow this is how it, it has been useful to society to create it in that way but recently particularly we have opened up more into the right brain but let's see now Having an emphasis on the left brain, how is that affecting us? Let's go into the, the uncomfortable talk. What happens when we are too much in the left brain? Well, too much thinking over details and analytical and critical and this, this is overthinking. And over analytical, yeah? And um, analyzing yourself, analyzing others, over analyzing, overthinking. Uh, and, and why? Because you want everything to be in the right order, everything to be logical and, and clear. So there is a certain obsession, or let's, let's say anxiety. But an obsession could very well be as well. Uh, let's say a constant need for control. Or to control, to control. For control, to control. Sorry, my prepositions. All right, so we are, uh, let's do it like this. Let's go over this side and then we will move on to that side. So too much overthinking, anxiety, because you want things to go in a particular way. You want to control them because there is a particular sequence. Beaju writes, Satnam, blessings to all of you. Wow, what is happening here already? Interesting. <laughs> yes, you missed, you missed quite a bit. We've been doing uh, ego and mind and consciousness. We are in the middle of a course, we're just starting actually, a course on the mind and this is the two hemispheres of the brain. You are very welcome. You can watch the rest of the recording later, but we're going to do a new, a new um, course on the mind and we are going to start with the physical structures of the brain. So this is where we are right now. And uh, yeah, we've been going on for, you know, almost an hour and a half, so uh, quite a bit. But uh, you can see this image. This is the the helpful and useful functions of the left hemisphere and these ones of the right hemisphere of the brain. Now, when this is our brain, in case you don't recognize it because it looks like a butterfly, left and right. This is my, my nose <laughs> and this is the, the two ears. I will catch it up all. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, why you do? And Summer Love says, we need to create right brain school. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, yoga, yoga I'll, 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 let me talk later about what yoga does for the, for the brain, yeah? But um, it's not just right brain, let's say both brains, yeah, because both brains are necessary. This is also important, yeah? But let's, let's equilibrate, let's balance all this imbalance that we have towards one side. So when we are too much on the left, we have overthinking, anxiety, constant need to control, and that creates a certain rigidity. We want things to go in a particular way because we are trying to control how they are. And, and, and that, that makes us difficult to change. Resistance to change. Yeah. We have a lack of creativity. Yeah, creativity is on this side. We, we want the, 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 thing, the things to stay the way they are. And, you know, we, we paint within the lines, yeah. Yeah. 
following the rules, following the, the logical way that things should be, following mathematical sequence of steps, and um, what else? Memory retrieval. And it's also like, you know, if I remember the way things are, I keep on wanting to be things that way. So, I, you know, it's hard to change. I want to stay the way things are. Yeah, we, we think in a particular habitual way. Yeah, we, we have a way to do things. We paint within the lines and we follow our habits. Yeah, habitual thinking. Habitual thought. Okay. And then what else? Well, if you know this, this issue of communication language, there's going to be communication issues. And mostly it's going to be around emotions. Because this is the emotional brain. So when we are in this realm and everything is trying to be logical, emotions are not logical. So how do I deal with that? Well, it's difficult to deal with them, actually. When you are in the left brain, you may be perceived as somebody who is called uh, machine-like, yeah? Maybe even unempathetic, which is not really true because you may have your emotions, but you are very logical in expressing them. And that can create frustration in somebody who is coming from the right hemisphere. And look, since we are talking about this, let me talk about an archetype. This is archetypically masculine and feminine. And, and look, we all have both brains. OK, I'm not saying that. Women are not logical and they are not good at math. If you go to mathematics in universities, it's filled with women. Yeah, there's a lot of women. And we cannot say that men are not creative. Yeah, there's a lot of creative men. We, we all have both brains. But the energy, this is the, this is the, this is a yang. And this is yin. So the, there's a feminine energy that is tendency to go here and there's a masculine energy to go here. And, it, you know, in regularly in a simple uh, a couple of a man and a woman having an argument, traditionally, generally, the way you will find them discuss is women will, will be communicating their emotions and their processing of the emotions and they are paying attention to nonverbal cues. And the man will be more trying to be more logical and step by step and facts, yeah? and more difficult to change, yeah? So this is the way we are generally going into. There's a tendency. We could say this is like 60% and 40%. So as a man, I'm more 60% left brain and 40% right brain, let's say, no? And for a woman, more 60% right and 40% left. But if we are all yogis, all yogis can learn to balance the hemispheres and call upon all the high qualities of both. So. This is the nasty <laughs> consequences of being too much overthinking, overanalyzing, and painting within the lines, following the rules on the left brain, yeah, cold and like a machine. Now, the opposite is also, it also has some negative consequences. Being too much on the right hemisphere, what does that do? do? Well, first of all, this is, this is about focus. This is about going out of focus. So actually being out of focus or a lack of focus. Women tend, tend to, but now we are talking about the right brain, it can do more than one thing at the same time, but that means it doesn't have the same level of awareness and focus that it will have on this side of the brain. So if there is an emphasis, an overemphasis, remember this is over, too much, emphasis of the right hemisphere of the brain, there's going to be a lack of focus on our activities. And um, yeah, what else? Well, rather than organizing and deciding how things are going to be um, and or in order, one thing after the other, all with a following pattern, it's going to be impuls impulsive. Im Impulsivity. Because it's created creativity but brought to the extreme. It's like being always creative, always in the moment, always on the fly, having no no plan. No no plan. This is planning. This is a planning brain. This is the no plan. 
So impulsivity, no plans. Um, and that means when you are not planning, you're not looking into the future. So you have a uh, disregard for consequences. Yeah, it's like being creative for creativity's sake. Yeah, just improvising. Improvising, yeah, improv. So creativity, wonderful. But when you are constant improvisation, constant impulsivity, no plans and you don't care for consequences, that can have serious consequences and you don't care for them. You know, if you don't care for them, they are going to come. You know, everything has a consequence. Yeah, you are you initiate a sequence. It has a consequence. Yeah, consequence. All right. What else? Well, if you are living in this creativity, you may go too much into it and end up in a fantasy land. Where this is this is disconnected from reality. You see, I've, I've stayed within the lines all the time, in every wing. Now I come to this wing and I find myself two eyes coming out of the line. Isn't it incredible? <laughs> here I was already trying to get out. And here I come and I'm already outside of the line. This is what it does. It doesn't like to stay within the lines. This part of the brain just wants to get out and express itself. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's incredible, huh? So it, as I am tuning into that part of my brain, it, it, it's happening. It's manifesting. Yeah, <laughs> right. It's funny. I find it funny anyway. OK, now the, the communication for the right brain is overwhelmingly emotional and emotionally overwhelming. So it's emotional over, over, over. Overwhelming. So it's a lot about emotions and very emotions. Uh, expansion, it's also opening and expanding, yeah? Yeah, this is like contracting and this is expanding, yes, good. So it's emotional, but it's overwhelming and it's ups and down. It's a roller coaster, it's a hypersensitivity. And allergy, yeah, why is there so many allergies in our society right now? Everybody's allergic to something and, you know, intolerant to gluten and all that. Wow, a lot of these hypersensitivities arising from our attempt to compensate this overemphasis on this side of the brain. We are now switching to the other and there is too much of the other. Now that's becoming almost karmic, yeah, on this side. Look at this beautiful butterfly. Okay, this is our butterfly brain and it's a good metaphor because our brain likes to fly like a butterfly looking for the nice flower that it wants to go into but wait a moment a butterfly flying with only one wing is not gonna work a butterfly needs both wings to fly so this is where from the perspective of yoga we say well okay we have two hemispheres every one of them has some sort of expression and benefits but we need we need both to operate now this is where when uh, i was talking in the anuloma biloma and and, and uh, study shodana video i was talking about how it is important to to uh, balance both hemispheres to get the most out of of them and one way to do that is the is the nadi shodana which i already explored in that video no but this the idea is that if I have a brain that has behaves like this, it has these two wings. Why cannot I explore and 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 get the best out of both, so that I can move it where I want it to go, rather than flying with only one wing, which creates an imbalance and creates all sorts of effects. So that's um, that's the idea. Now, brain is complex and 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 much is interconnected. But it would be nice if we could consciously create a higher connection between the two hemispheres. 
And look, these two hemispheres are necessary and they actually complement each other. But even for somebody who is working on the left hemisphere um, field, you can benefit from the right. Le so let's say, let's take maths, okay? If you're a mathematician, you know, mathematics, when you are learning mathematics, it's a lot about learning rules. But if you want to evolve the field of mathematics, if, if you want to expand towards a new horizon, you need creativity. You cannot stay with the rules. Now, let me, let me just give an example, okay? And, I, and I'm aware I may lose some people on this example because uh, some people don't like maths. But if you have some patience, stay and listen to that, yeah? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit, a beautiful example of creativity in mathematics. Very simple, okay? Um, but I remember when I learned about this in university, I thought that it was one of the most beautiful demonstrations um, on, on mathematics. And it, it shows, and I, I look back at this example, how it shows the right hemisphere operating. And this is about prime numbers. A prime number is, is one that you can only, uh, it's a number that is, is more than one, and it can only be, it's a, it cannot be, it cannot be a product of other two numbers. Yeah? So it can only be uh, a product of one and its number. So for example, let's say number six can be two times three. This is a product of two numbers, so six is not prime. But number seven can only be a product of the two numbers seven times one. It cannot be any other combination when um, because we said it's more than one, so this has to be a prime number. So a prime number is only div div divisible by itself and one. Yeah. So if we have the prime numbers and, and you look at them, two, three, five, seven, 11, 13, 17, you think, well, uh, how do I know which is the next? Because it's not very clear. From here to here, there is one, but from three to five, there is two. From five to seven, it's two, but now, now it is four, and now it's two again, and from 13 to 17 is four. So how do I understand what is the next prime number? It's not clear. And there is, no, there is no clear mathematical function to find the next prime number. If you find it, then you can make yourself a millionaire. Yeah? Finding what is the next prime number is, quite a, is, is, is not a solved situation. And at some point in the history of mathematics, they say, well, is it guaranteed that we can always find a new one? Is it there is an infinite number of prime numbers? I don't know. Well, the, the, the demonstration that I was referring to that is very creative way is saying, well, let's imagine that all these numbers are the total number of prime numbers that there are. There is not going to be any higher number prime number than this. Well, if we do, if we multiply all these numbers, that's going to give one number, x. So that number is not prime because it's the multiplication of all this. But if I do x plus 1, that cannot be divisible by any of this because it's just plus 1. So it cannot be divided by 2. It cannot be divided by 3 because by 3 would have to be x plus 3. By 5, only if it was x plus 5. If by 7, x plus 7. You understand? So by taking the product of all this and adding 1, this is also a prime number. So it takes the idea of what the definition of a prime number is and it finds a very creative way. To, instead of trying to find the function that describes all prime numbers, it takes them and in a very creative way describes because we can find another prime, that means that there are infinite primes. There will always be another one. You, we multiply by all the others and then we add one and we will always have another one. So. I hope I didn't lose you on the demonstration, but it was just a simple example. But showing how even in mathematics, if you want to, you know, that whoever came up with this demonstration first, they didn't apply just the regular rules of mathematics, analytical and logical 
because there is no clear function on how to produce prime numbers. It had to be creative and find a different way to bring it in. So even if you work on a field that is purely on this side of the brain, this side is very complementing and is very necessary. And it can make something like this demonstration. I find it elegant and beautiful and, and seeing it, it, it. Look, do you remember? This is about contextual. It's about global. Yeah, it's coming out. And this is what this was doing. Yeah, seeing the globality, looking outwards, looking outside of the rule, looking out of the rules. So it's a good example of how to apply the, the, the right brain to the something that is purely, apparently purely left brain, but it's not. Yeah. So let's talk about what benefits would it have to balance the, the, two, hemis the two hemispheres. One, well, as I just showed, you can enhance your cognitive abilities by, by being capable of, of harnessing the power of analytical thinking and bringing the creativity. So that, that's going to create a much more enhanced capacity to, to process and to see the world and to think. So that's one, one of them. Another is that you can optimize learning. So emotional processing, the processing of emotions. Do you remember in the, in the other, what I was talking before, how when we are children for a baby, when a baby is playing, a baby is learning. And there is no difference for a baby uh, between playing and learning. It's the same. Now, when we grow older, we try to learn without playing. And then we put our shoulders in a library and with a book in front of us and we try to squeeze into our brain this information, but we are not having fun. If we are not having fun, then it's, it's harder to learn. And fun is part of an emotional thing. So by bringing the right hemisphere emotional aspect of fun into a left hemisphere thinking, you kind of optimize the capacity to memorize, to understand and to learn and um, yeah, learn new things. Yeah. So having both sides and also not just paying attention to the details, but looking at the context because you need to learn how these elements are connected to see how everything works. So it's actually both sides of the hemispheres are going to help the logical, but also the contextual. That's uh, where the learning is going to happen. So learning. Now, obviously, um, there is going to be an impact on emotions. Now, emotions, I said that it was something that is um, mostly related to the right hemisphere. But if you're going too much into the right hemisphere, you go into this hypersensitivity and emotional overwhelming. So we need to look at emotions from here as well. The left hemisphere can, can bring us, can bring a little bit of, excuse me, a cold, slow down attitude of looking at what's happening. Oh, I'm feeling emotional. Okay, but let me, let me look at it. Let me explore it. Let me analyze it. Let me process it. And let me choose whether this is an emotion that I need to express or one that I need to contain rather than just going full out emotion, but actually Oh, right. I need to express it. Okay. So then, okay, let's, let's give it more space for that. No. So the right hemisphere helps to balance that an overly emotional uh, ex ex expression, which turns into an explosion and can bring a balance to that and, and choose whether you're going to express it or not. So that's a balancing emotion, balancing emotional life. That's very important from both hemispheres perspective. Now there is a studies showing how both hemispheres working at the same time improves the, the attention, the well-being, of course, what I was saying about the fun, but also memory and learning. So we are talking about health, just brain health. So by having both brain uh, hemispheres connected, it's just going to increase your health and your well-being of your brain in general. And brain transfers into mind and mind transfers into everything and also consciousness. So uh, we are talking about well-being. And uh, by, you know, if we have two hemispheres of the brain, which are two aspects of myself, why not integrate them? Why should I choose to go into one or the other? Why not bring the best, the best of both? Yeah. So it's about integration. 
And we know yoga is a lot about integration. The very word yoga is union. So we could say, you know, let's unite both aspects. Yeah, and operate from the union of the two. And then finally, of course, we know from yoga that actually when you balance both aspects, you are stimulating the middle path. And the middle path is an, a, a, a reflection of the Shushumna. Yeah, the both aspects are connected to Ida and Pingala as well. These two hemispheres are connected to Yin and Yang, connected to the two nostrils and Ida and Pingala. So by balancing both, you are actually stimulating Shushumna, which is going to stimulate the Kundalini to rise and to get to the, an enlightened state. So at the end of the day, there's so all these benefits, yeah? Let me just re remember them one more time. It's like enhanced cognitive abilities, learning, much better to learning and having fun while we do that. And that's gonna bring some well-being. Also because there is a more balance of the emotions and knowing when to express and when to uh, contain them and that more physical and emotional well-being and it's a more integrated aspect of myself everything is integrated and through that integration then going into my core and my center then i have a more enlightened experience and state make sense right that's the butterfly one we, uh, uh, we uh, mind settling into a little leaf and slowly moving both wings and just stay in there, yeah? And there is a beauty in there, just both of them, but holding still and an integrated experience of both aspects. So hopefully that's clear. Hopefully that, that shows that we want that. That's what we need. And we need to learn how to stimulate the right brain if we have an overemphasis on the left brain. But at the end of the day, we want a total balance between both. Okay, so if we want that, how do we achieve this balance? How, do we, how are we going to balance both hemispheres? Well, one way would be like the Nadi Shodana that I already explored in the other video. Another way to do that is by bringing the butterfly still on, on one leaf yeah? and exploring that stillness. Now that um, when we do Tratakam, when we look at one point and, and stay still, then whatever is unstable in us manifests and then calms down. And in this calming of the mind, generally the mind that we calm is the left hemisphere. If we have a tendency to be too much here, overthinking and anxiety, simply by calming the mind, that's already going to help bringing a more unified activation of both hemispheres. So that's, that's, um, that's helpful. Therefore, any practice that is going to help to calm the mind, any pranayama that is going to calm the mind, that's going to already help us bring more into balance. Meditation practices which stimulate the pituitary. The pituitary is a, is a gland that is in command of all the other glands and is also bringing, it can also bring balance to ourselves. So stimulation of the pituitary is going to balance being in the middle as well. It's in the middle of the two hemispheres. So it's going to help balance both. And then practices that in which we integrate all different aspects of ourselves, like yoga nidra, for example, meditation. This is going to help balance and integrate all aspects of ourselves, including our two hemispheres of the brain. On a more physical level, we could say also asanas that because the, this hemisphere is in connection with the right side of the body, and this one with the left side of the body, if I'm doing an asana that is lifting one arm, or like even, not even asanas, just like cross crawl. You know, have you seen this cross crawl where you are uh, jumping and moving the arms and, and doing a repetitive movement in which there is a left and a right being activated one after the other? That's activating one hemisphere, one hemisphere, one, 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 one. And that's creating connections between both. So both in yoga, asanas which have this balance attitude to both sides but also exercises like cross crawl or even running it can help that's why it can be so calming just go running in the in, in the morning yeah just go into nature just start running it calms the mind it's balancing both hemispheres it's very calming and and you can have great ideas very creative ideas in that moment because it's stimulating the whole brain so that's um, lovely as well yeah uh, but yeah, any practice that would go with both sides, let's say like the sun salutation, you are, 
you know, going up and down and one leg back, but in the next round you go with the other leg back, you're doing it slowly and consciously with the breath, that's also helping to integrate both hemispheres. And uh, what else can help balance both hemispheres? I talked about the breath. If you want to stimulate only one of them for a particular reason, then we have, you know, it, let's say you are overly uh, in this side or overly in that side, and you may want to stimulate the opposite. Well, you could, you could, you could, you could like, just close one nostril and, act, and breathe three minutes through this nostril. Breathing three minutes to the red, right nostril is going to be stimulating the left, particularly if you do breath of fire. It's going to stimulate the left nostril. And the opposite, if I close the right nostril and I stimulate the left, it's going to open the right. Summer love, uh, you say, do you see colors when you meditate? It is, it is a natural thing that may happen. Some people are more um, like they have a, a higher tendency towards the realm of the vision. Some have a more towards the realm of feelings or hearing sounds. So some people will hear a subtle sound, some people will be uh, feeling subtle feelings, and some people will see colors. And, and there's nothing, no right, no wrong about it. It's just part of the experience of meditation. And particularly if you are doing a meditation that concentrates on the third eye, uh, as you are concentrated on that point, that's gonna, this is the, the, the projection of our mind. This is where we project our images. So it's natural that they may project some colors, some images. It may, it may be also a natural expression of your chakras. Movement of energy within the chakras can manifest colors. But I would say, I would say that's just like you're driving towards your destiny and you see some landscape. Yeah. Oh, look, like that's a nice windmill. Yeah, passing by. Oh, okay. Oh, look, a nice lake over there. And uh, look, look at the mountain, right? But that's just something circumstantial, right? The objective of meditation is not to get to the colors. If the colors come, what do you do? You observe them, you see them, and let them go. It's part of the experience, but it's not the objective. The objective of, of um, meditation is enlightenment, which is light. And light is pure light, it's not color. So if you are seeing colors, it's like part of the landscape in your journey towards the light. Uh, and it's fine, but you don't necessarily have to do anything with that. And if you don't see colors, you don't have to worry about that either, because uh, everyone has their own tendency. Does it make sense, Summer? Let me know if it um, kind of answers your question. But there is one color that is a little bit different. Maybe I should just mention this, the blue color. Because if we, if we focus on the tip of the nose, there is a number of meditations like Nilkant, uh, and um, which it's called like the blue pearl. And if you focus on this point, you may see a blue color opening up here. And that could be like the stimulation of the opening of a passage towards another state of consciousness. So I see, yeah, the blue, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it can be like a pearl. I think there is a book I think it was Swami Muktananda, Play of Consciousness. I, 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 may, I may not remember exactly right, but I think there was this book and he talks about how he sees this blue and through this blue pearl, he just goes into a, like another, another realm, kind of like a, having a, like seeing himself in an astral realm, sort of, yeah. And uh, he has all sorts of experiences, visits past lives and he goes through a lot. But yeah, blue is the color of Shiva and Krishna, and it has a lot of uh, symbolism. But I believe it is natural, a natural stimulation of that color when you are opening the, the pituitary. The pituitary is very, very active. I'm wondering what is that? Is that God's spark? Well, you just answered that. Yeah, yeah. So that blue th pearl, that's like a passage. You know, when, the, when you see Krishna and he has the Chandra and the Bindu, you know, like a half a moon and a dot. <clears throat> it, it, it says that if you do Tratakam on the dot, 
you can just cross through with your consciousness to a hyper conscious state to a higher consciousness so and and the color blue i i think it's a metaphor when they talk about the story of krishna and the poison it's a nice metaphor but it's talking also about this blue aspect and there is something in kundalini yoga we talk about the blue ethers and you know ether is the fifth element and the fifth chakra is the th the, the throat and is the color blue and this is a hole as well the throat is empty is the only area of the body which is empty the lungs are not empty even when you exhale they collapse but the trachea holds still so this chakra is connected to emptiness and when you can go into emptiness emptiness is zero zero is called shunya which is incidentally very close connected to sunya which means listening so as you are listening into the emptiness when you are chanting mantras and you listen to the emptiness you can go to this hole through the hole it stimulates this point, the point of the fifth chakra, which is connected to the word. The word was with God, the word is God. So by chanting mantras and stimulating this fifth chakra, stimulating the emptiness, going through that emptiness, then you may experience that blue color, which is opening the path towards the ether. And there is these five blue ethers, which are beyond the electromagnetic field of the earth and beyond even the astral realms where, you know, the gurus are right the gurus are there and there is a this is the place where if we are bliss, blessed we go after we die the blue ethers maybe someday we will talk about death and not today we have been i've been talking already for two hours it's been a lot i'm not going to go into open a, a whole new topic but let's just say that this blue ether is where the saints the sages the 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 radhas the shivas the the brahmans live yeah in this in this space that is in a different state of consciousness and and yes indeed if you just see colors like a variety of colors this is just part of the landscape if the, if you see like a concentrated blue pearl on the tip of the of your of your nose there is a pack practice in yoga nasi kagre yeah when you concentrate the eyes on the tip of the nose you leave the nose you leave the eyes one tenth open and then concentrate it on the pearl you may feel something very heavy here and then like something breaking and opening and it will be your third eye opening up and then the blue light becomes more stronger and then you open up to higher levels of consciousness so yeah the the blue is a particularly specific uh, is different from the other colors i do some i i hope it was is useful you have any more questions feel free to to write them down so where are we i think it's enough i think we've done enough about the brain uh we've covered the two hemispheres the the, the properties that it has this butterfly beautiful brain and the, the higher functions and also the challenges when we are overly in one or the other of the two hemispheres and why should we want to balance them the next this is a lot about the cortex of the brain yeah even though the emotions are also a lot about the limbic system we will talk more about the hardware about the physical structures of the brain in the next video we'll talk about the evolution of the brain throughout the species from in animals for, to humans and how there are different layers coming up to this air this cortex where there is the left and the right so we will do that in detail in another another day but um for now, I think it's enough. It, oh, so I feel like it's a lot. I feel like I have like put a lot of stuff right here, like on you, right? Uh, I hope it wasn't too much and it was enough that you could process it and you could see the benefits of knowing uh, these two aspects of me, this yin and yang and this polarity and how, um, how useful can it be to integrate both. And it can be an inspiration for, for all of us to integrate. So uh, I think it's enough for today uh, and uh, I appreciate you being here. Uh, some of you have stayed for the, the whole time, I guess, even though I don't see individually everyone who is connected unless you speak in the chat. But I've seen um, many people, all of you, you know, the six, at least six viewers all the time. <laughs> so that's uh, it's uh, I appreciate your commitment to stay for a few hours talking about this. Someone says, thank you so much. 
Do you know what brainwave is that when you see the blue pearl? Is it theta? Probably, it, it probably is. I, I don't think there is a particular study because it's not easy to a yogi to say, okay, go into the blue pearl and then they measure it with sensors because you know, there are not so many meditators who have that capacity to go into a particular state of consciousness and the scientists with monitoring what's happening, no? But yeah, it, was, it, it would probably be towards the theta. G-I-Y, Satnam, hello, it's good to see you here. And again, thank you everyone who was here and thank you for watching the video. And um, I will come back tomorrow at the same time. Uh, so if anybody wants to come tomorrow, I'm not sure if we will go into the brain tomorrow. We may, or we may just do a mantra session. Maybe some just mantra chanting or maybe something else. Depends on you. If you are here and you want to talk about something, just uh, just say, you got in last minute, but you appreciate it. Why do? Summer, I appreciate your, your presence. Thank you, everyone. And many blessings. And until tomorrow, if you come or until next time. Sanam.